Welcome to the in-person worship service for Clarendon United Methodist Church. We're so happy you joined us today. The order of worship can be found on our website, www.clarendonumc.org slash worship. There you will also be able to give your tithes and offerings online, www.clarendonumc.org slash give. We thank you so much for your support during this time of need. Now, let us join our hearts in worship.
Baptist Church. We're so happy to have you with us today. If you're joining us online, we'd like to invite you to like, comment, and share our streaming service today. You may also find links to our website for church happenings and where you may give your tithes and offerings online. As we are taking part in communion today, if you're joining us online, we'd also like to invite you to find elements of bread and juice for the Lord's table. If you're joining us in person, please find the pew pads at the end of the pews to help us collect the attendance while you're here. If you're new to the church, following the service, our pastors will be at the sanctuary doors and would love to get to know you. It's going to be a great Sunday in church. Now, let us prepare our hearts and minds in worship. Would you please rise as you're able for the greeting? In love, God created us. In love, Christ came to us. In love, the Spirit has formed us into community. Through our life together, may God's love be made known. Let us pray. Holy God, we come to worship today to hear your good news, to hear of faith, hope and love ringing out from your kingdom. We know that doubt, fear, and hatred can shake even the strongest of us. Shape us into faithful, hopeful people. Fill us with your love that passes all understanding. We pray this together in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. Dear friends, welcome today as we gather in the name of Jesus Christ and join in worship of the living God. Welcome to Clarendon United Methodist Church. Welcome home. If this is your first time with us, we are especially excited that you're here and want to get to know you and want to, to say what a privilege it is to join in worship with you this morning. And all of those who are watching online, we are thrilled to be worshiping together with you as well, all one church family. It's such a joy to be able to see those who are here and to see when folks check in online. We notice that and celebrate. Uh, indeed, uh, anytime you're watching online, if you're watching via YouTube, there's a way to check in and to, to engage in conversation. Um, first, just to say that you're there so that we know who's worshiping with us online, but also to be able to check in with each other a little bit. It's a wonderful way to add to our sense of community with one another. I want to call your attention to some of the announcements today. Uh, one is that there are multiple ways that you can connect with our church, and we have uh, put some of those into our announcements so you can see more clearly. We have an app that you can use to sign up for events and small groups. It makes it really easy. Also, it's a good way to give online. And we've also listed all our social media accounts. They're a great way to connect with the church and also to invite friends and to let them know about what's happening in our faith family. Uh, we are about to begin our second set of life groups, the small groups that have been meeting for a six-week period. The first set of life groups was wonderful, extremely well received by the folks who were a part of them. And so the second group is about to begin the week of February 6th. And the way you sign up for them is a little bit different than our usual methods. We're asking you to tell us when you're available, and then we'll set you up in a life group that matches your timing. So you can either uh, sign up online or at the doors of the church today. Uh, I really strongly encourage this wonderful way for a short term to connect more deeply with others in the church family. I see some folks who are in the congregation, in the sanctuary today, who have been part of the first set of life groups. And we'll hear a little bit about more about that later in the service. 
Dan Dixon would like to share an announcement that we are starting up our reading program again, a reading program in a local Arlington County school. And we're looking for volunteers to staff that. And if you'd like to be a part of, or to volunteer for it, if you'd like to be a part of that, then you can either see Dan in the yellow, wave Dan after the service, or you can check in online. I, uh, check in, in the church office is what I mean. If you're online, just contact the church office and we'll get your name that way. Next Sunday is gonna be a big day for us for two reasons. First of all, uh, as you know, because of the Omicron variant, we have not been singing all through the month of January. Has it not been a long month without singing in our worship services? But we knew that it was prudent in these challenging times. And we're happy to report that because the numbers are coming down substantially in our area, we're going to resume singing next Sunday. Hip, hip, hooray. Next Sunday, we will also have another thing going on, and that is the installation of our church council. We'll be praying over our church leaders as they offer themselves in ministry in the year ahead. So we look forward to seeing you next Sunday as we gather once more in worship. We now invite the children to come up to hear a very special message for them. Okay, so today we're gonna talk about Love. You know, this month is, or next month, we're on in February, is that there's a special, uh, what is it, Charlotte? <laughs> Valentine's Day, yeah, all about love. So today, we're going to, yes. Um, I'm going Okay, so she's talking about Cupid and how Cupid flies around and and like <laughs> yes, sure. The strange thing about Valentine's Day is that that was the day that Saint Valentine died. <laughs> <laughs> I'm learning a lot here. I don't think I need to even say anything here. Anyway, so what is love? What is what do you think about love, Rebecca? I mean not Rebecca. I think that love is the feeling that you get from someone or something that you really enjoy being around or really enjoy doing. Hey, yeah, it's usually kind of as a feeling, you know, you feel love for somebody. But you know what? The Bible tells it it's also an action. It's like a superhero. Love is an action and not necessarily, it's a feeling too, but it's also an action. So how do you think your parents show you love? I mean, think about your parents. They, you know they love you, don't you? Right? They show you that you can do anything. They have confidence in you, don't they? They show you that they, you can do anything. How about when they buy you food to eat? Is that love? How about a nice place to sleep? That's love, right? Those are all things that people show each other. What about you? Can you show your friends love? I think about showing them. What would you do, Catherine? You can bring them a band aid, you can help them if they got hurt. Yeah. Yeah, you can take them to the doctor. Nice. Yeah, you can take them to the doctor. And even if you can't take them, you can give them a car or do something nice for them if they got sick. So those are all really great things. Now, this is the hard part. What if somebody who's been mean to you, does God want us to? Do you love those people? Yeah, Charlotte says thumbs up, yes, of course. God says you have to love everybody, even if sometimes, and that's the hard part, isn't it? 
So I'm going to read a scripture for you. And what I want you to do is hold up your hands. You're going to count. Okay? I want you to count how many ways that you hear about loving. Okay? Love is patient. One. You put it your finger up? One. Love is kind. Two. It does not want what belongs to others. Three. It does not brag. It is not proud. It doesn't dishonor other people. It doesn't look out for its own interests. You don't know, you're not selfish. Love isn't selfish. It does not become angry. Oh. It does not keep track of other people's wrongs. It's like tattling and stuff on people. Love is not happy with evil, and it is full of joy. So how many is that? Eleven. Great. Those are all things that we can do, and the way we can be to show love to everyone. So I want you to bow your heads over the same prayer, but instead of putting your hands up like a prayer, we're going to put them up like a heart. Can you do that? You make a heart with your hands. Can you show them, Charlotte? Okay. You make a heart and you show all those people out there you love. Okay? So can you repeat after me? Our Father, thank you for the love that you show us every single day. Thank you for the love that you show us every single day. Help us to love others like you love us. Help us to love others like you love us. And especially those people who might be harder to love. And especially those people who might be harder to love. Thank you, O oh God, for your love. Thank you, O oh God, for your love. Amen. Amen. A reading from 1 Corinthians, chapter 13, verses 1 through 13. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all of my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. We know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, 
and the greatest of these is love. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. from the 13th chapter of Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. Paul is at his finest as he pens these beautiful words. I learned a new word about the scripture this week as I read about our passage today. This chapter is referred to as an encomium, a word I'd never heard before, a speech of praise, an encomium about the gift of love. The eloquence of Paul is something I've always admired in this text. We tend to sentimentalize it though. Do you notice that? To romanticize it, which really isn't all that surprising considering how often it's used at weddings. Indeed, Len and I read out from this text, or someone read for us this text when we were married nearly 30 years ago. It is a beautiful, text to read at a wedding. It reminds us, and particularly it reminds the two marital partners that they both need to work hard to maintain the, the gift of love as a centerpiece in their life together. It shows the power and the challenge of love, proclaiming that love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. This is a test, a text that sharpens our understanding of love. It, let a, it help, lets us know more about what love is, especially as we look at the way that we treat each other. Of course, Paul wasn't talking about weddings when he wrote this text. He was writing in this lyrical essay about love. He was writing about the, the crucial need to love one another within the church, to hold each other in mutual concern and consideration. It's helpful to look at chapter 13 a little bit in its historical context. Paul had been to Corinth. We've been talking about this in the last couple of weeks. He had worked to establish a church there. It was still a new community of faith, trying to figure out what it was to be a church. What is a church in the first place, this early in the first century, trying to figure out how to, to move through the world as believers in Jesus Christ, who were linked together in love. So now Paul is responding to a letter that he had received from that fledgling church, a letter that had raised questions about the foundations upon which Christian life and faith should be built. In Paul's absence from Corinth, because he had gone on to plant other churches in other communities, there was debate. There were confusing new ways of thinking that were competing with each other within the Corinthian church. Debate that developed about the importance of various spiritual gifts that were manifesting themselves among the believers. We've talked about the gift of speaking in tongues, for example, glossolalia, it's called. Speaking in the language of the angels, it's sometimes called. A, a gift that some in Corinth were exploring and then using and then lording over others, not building up the body. And so in chapter 12, we talked about how Paul focused on being members of the body of Christ together, on how we are to build up that body and all we do and to build one another up, using a still more excellent way than all these spiritual gifts. That's how he ends chapter 12. 
I will show you a still more excellent way. And then outflows the lyrical verses of chapter 13. That excellent way is love. At first, Paul indulges the Corinthians in this chapter. He goes into a, a lovely patient discussion celebrating the gifts of prophecy and tongues of faith and charity. He acknowledges that these are good things, these gifts of the Spirit. They're signs of the vitality of the Christian community. And they are beneficial to the church when these gifts are exercised well within it for the building up of the body. Yes, earnestly desire these spiritual gifts, he says, but in the end, there is a more excellent way. So we get to the, the middle section of chapter 13, and love is described. Love is, says Paul. Love is this, love is that. We heard a lot about what Paul said about love. Notice that he speaks about love in both positive and negative terms. He comes at it from both angles. He says, love is patient and kind, attributes that in other parts of his letters he uses to refer to God. God is patient and kind. God's love is patient and kind. Our love for one another should be the same. But then he starts talking about the, the things that love is not. He comes from the negative side. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant, or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It doesn't rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. The weight of Paul's message falls on these eight negative aspects in the list, most of which correspond uncomfortably strongly with the behavior of the Corinthians in the church in Corinth. Paul describes their behavior elsewhere in the letter and it is really clear as he describes what love is not that he's hitting pretty close to home for them. Love is not envious uh, a rivalry, an intense rivalry has, has grown up in the church in Corinth, and, and Paul is saying that has no place in our life together. In love, we don't envy one another. We don't act contentiously toward one another. Love is not envious. It does not pull us apart from one another. Then he says, love is not arrogant or boastful. One, one translation says, love is not puffed up. A, maybe a stronger way to put it. He's been reprimanding the Corinthian community for the way some of them are puffed up about their spiritual gifts being better than others and others feeling excluded or left out not important, not essential to the life that they share in Jesus Christ. Knowledge, he said, puffs up, but love builds up. And then he talks about love is not rude. A harsh way to speak about the Corinthian, Corinthian community, but it's behavior that he has observed in their midst. They're starting to get the message, I'm sure, that this behavior of theirs contradicts the character of love as Paul shares it. So Paul has said, what is love not? Well, now let's go back and talk about what love is. Love is that which bears all things believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. 
love never ends. It's as though he's used that central section talking about what love is not to remind them of their behavior in the Corinthian church. But then he takes them back to the gift that is love and the challenge that is love and reminds them of how valuable it is to live in love together, to bear all things with one another and for one another, to believe all things, to hope all things, to endure all things with and for one another. These things build up the body of Christ. They build community and strength with one another. Love never ends. Love never fails us. The Corinthians, stung by the recognition of how their behavior has pulled away from love, can channel themselves back in to a recommitment to living in God's way of love. Paul ends the text with a favorite trio of his, words that mark the character of Christian existence. He talks about them in other places as well. He says, so now, faith and hope and love abide, these three, faith and hope and love dwelling together in our life in the church, these three and the greatest of these is love. It's the greatest because it undergirds the other two and everything else in our life together. And it gives meaning to our faith and to our hope. Love is the ground of our meaning in Christ. Paul speaks a strong word to the church at Corinth. I wonder if, if this chapter was the heart of what he is trying to say, not only to this community, but to all of the early church. It's no wonder this letter was treasured and passed from place to place, even though it criticized the Christian community. You know it must have been transformative or they wouldn't have wanted to share it with anybody. But instead it was passed from Christian to Christian, from church to church, and shared through the early years, and now passed down to us. And we read it afresh. I invite you every time you go to a wedding and hear that text, not just to think about the couple in love, but to think about your own love, how you live it out. Is it something that is sometimes challenging for you, bearing all things, believing all things, hoping all things, enduring all things in love. It's a gift and a challenge together. But it's, it's not just about two people loving each other. It's about the love we share with one another, the ground of our existence in Jesus Christ, the, the source of meaning in our church, that love that is poured into us by God through Christ and that enlivens us and guides us as we gather in Christian community. Love is the ground of our meaning. And indeed, anything we do, if it is done without love, is meaningless. Paul makes that clear. If I do things without love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Interesting note, by the way, bronze work was a major activity in the city of Corinth, the making of bronze vessels. And so talking about a, a clanging, noisy gong speaks directly to the people of Corinth. In, in several places in our text, he uses references that speak directly to the work of the Corinthian people. 
They also work with mirrors. They're, they're well-known mirror makers in the first century. So he says, now I look within a mirror dimly, then I shall see face to face, connecting directly with the Corinthian community. But, but if I do all wonderful things, if I exhibit spiritual gifts with the best of them, but don't have love, it's meaningless. It's nothing. Love is the source of all of our meaning. And love, says Paul, is not something that just springs up in you, that emerges overnight. It's not just a, a one-time decision and all of a sudden, bingo, you love perfectly. Love is a cultivated art. It's something that's mu that must be practiced, rehearsed. It's kind of what I think a church service sometimes is, in a way. A, a practicing, a rehearsal of our loving one another and our worshiping God. You don't just do it automatically unless you hone it in your life. You create channels in your life for love to move freely, for worship to be natural. And so we gather week after week after week, and we practice and we rehearse together. We love one another. Sometimes I, I find it remarkable when I'm engaging in the larger world outside of the Christian community, because we practice so hard together that, that love really is a topic on our minds. And sometimes it's a harsh reality in the world that we forget about love. We get on with business and climbing the social ladder and, and gaining all of our resources and building up our retirement and taking care of our families and those closest to us and we forget about that clarion call to love. How important it is for us to practice again and again and again. We've got to get it right in the church so we can take it out into the world and bear that love and share that love and model that love for any who are struggling with it in the day-to-day -day grind or in the frightening circumstances or the upsetting challenges that face us in life. Love is something that requires the formation of our character. We don't just teach it to our children, we teach it to each other and practice it side by side, day by day. It's a habit that's not learned overnight. Living love, that's something you hear from this preacher all the time. Are you tired of it? No. Nope. Nope. Amen. Amen. <laughs> For those online, I heard the word nope a lot. I hope you said it too. It's not something we get tired of, is it? It's not something for just a season in this church. We have claimed that as our, our motto, our theme, our, our words of guidance, living love, living the love of Jesus Christ in our own hearts and in our life together and in our life in the world which God loves. Living love. It, it wasn't just a, a sermon series. It wasn't just this year's topic. It's something that has guided us and strengthened us and brought us closer together in Jesus Christ. We've wrestled with challenges in our, our culture challenges in our denomination, challenges in the midst of a pandemic, together, guided by that, that wonderful understanding that the living love of Jesus Christ is present in our midst, and that it demands something from us. It requires something. It invites something. It celebrates something already here in us. Living love. It's a cultivated practice in our life together. So let's use this Sunday, 
when in our study of 1 Corinthians, we happen to come upon the love chapter, as people sometimes call it. Let's not just hear it as that thing we read at weddings. Let's hear it afresh and ask, how am I living the love of Jesus Christ here in this community of faith and out there in the world? But here in the church, how does the living love of Christ guide my relationships with others, guide my choices about what I suggest we do, what I begin as a ministry in the church, what I contribute my time and my heart to, what I offer my giving for, what I use my spiritual gifts to enhance. How do I engage with the living love of Jesus Christ is the criterion by which we should assess all of our ministries, and we seek to do that. Even the very finest of our ministries, if they do not have love, they are nothing, Paul would tell us. We learn from today's text that love isn't just a matter of feelings. Feelings come and go, but love never and as for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, poof, it's gone. But faith and hope and love abide. And the greatest of these, the undergirding of it all, is love. OK, so the text is read at weddings. That's, that's a, a time when two people make a covenant together, a lifelong covenant to love one another. So let's run with that covenant theme. I wonder if, if we could read 1 Corinthians 13 as a covenant, a vow between ourselves, a covenant with one another. We, we pledge to be patient and kind, not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude, not to insist upon our own way, not to, to work for injustice, to work for that which is wrong, but to work always for the right. Instead of all of the negatives, we will bear all things, believe all things, hope all things, endure all things. Our love will never end. All the other things of life may cease, but our love will never end. How does our life change when we make that covenant with one another? It's what we do ultimately when we stand up in front of the congregation and become members of the church. We vow to love and support one another. But this text brings it up close, again, afresh, anew. We vow to make love the practice of our life together, to, to make it the meaning which undergirds all of our ministries, the source of our joy in life together. I, I found it just wonderful to dwell with a text, sometimes chastising me this week. And in recent weeks, I've been reading about love for weeks, knowing the sermon was coming up. And sometimes it chastises me and reminds me and, and nudges me and corrects me. I'm thinking afresh, but also it invites me to deepen my bonds with beloved members of my, my family in Christ, and to deepen my bonds of love as I carry that out into the world. Love never ends. Instead of letting fear or irritability or, or pride or, or arrogance or any of the other struggles of our life influence our life together, we will love. 
We do love. We move forward because of love. We survive a pandemic through our love for one another and our love for the world that God loves. Faith and hope and love abide. And we covenant together that the greatest thing in our life as a family of faith is and will always be the love of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Can I get an amen? Amen. 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 And thanks be to God. And now we turn to respond to God's word in another way. The sermon is a response to the word of God. Let's turn to find another way to respond to God's grace given to us in the word of God and in God's grace flowing through our life. One other way we do it is through the giving of our financial resources. And so we have a time of offering each week, a time when we remember that we personally respond in a multitude of ways with a multitude of gifts to God's grace. Today, we'd like to take a moment to highlight one of the many ministries of the church that our offerings support. So let's turn now and listen to a video that tells us about our life groups. My name is Noreen Quill. I just recently completed a six-week session in a life group. Uh, the, there were two life groups this time, one on Wednesday at noon and one on Wednesday evening. The Wednesday evening one met in person, our new one met on Zoom. We had a really good time. It was a great opportunity for me to get to know other people that I don't spend a lot of time with. and. Uh, get a feeling for how they felt with regard to um, Jesus and the church. Neil C. kept it interesting with various questions. She kept it easy and laid back so no one had to panic or um, be anxious about it at all. Uh, we would talk about Tracy's sermon uh, from the previous Sunday and how it impacted our lives during the week. And uh, we would talk also about John Wesley's general rules. Uh, what good have you done this week? What harm have you done this week? And how have you stayed in love with God? And I found it very enlightening. I don't get to have those kinds of philosophical conversations very much anymore. And I really enjoyed the time that I spent in that group with um, the amazing people that uh, I was grouped with. And I am really looking forward to being in one of the new life groups when we start up again. It's a lot of fun, you get to meet people. It's really an enjoyable time. I hope you can join us. God bless you as you give. Let us now turn to God in prayer. Holy God, we celebrate your love at work in our lives. Your love is patient. We give you thanks for all those who've been patient with us and have taught and cared for us. And we pray for the patience to love others as you have loved us. Your love is kind. Give us the courage to be kind to others and to serve those with patience who are sometimes unkind, rude, difficult to love, even our enemies. They are your children and our sisters and brothers. They were made in your image. Your love is not arrogant or pretentious. Give us insight to speak the truth in love and for the sake of your kingdom not out of a need to appear clever or right. And in all our relationships, give us the wisdom to listen far more than we speak. Your love does not insist on its own way. 
We thank you and pray for those who serve the poor and those in need who don't seek their own interests, who give tirelessly of themselves, who have much to do and little time for themselves. Your love is not quick-tempered. We pray for those who are angry and for the violent and for their victims, for children who fear, for elders who are abused, for people trapped in relationships that injure and harm. Oh God, your love bears all things. We remember before you those with heavy burdens, many cares, much stress, and too little comfort and help, especially in these difficult times. Open our eyes to those around us and their needs and give us the wisdom to offer help without any sense of superiority. Your love never fails. Even death does not trespass on the breadth and depth of your love, O oh God. We thank you for those we've loved in this life who now dwell in the peace and joy of your presence. And let your comfort settle on those who are bereaved or who are lonely on this day. All these things we pray as we celebrate the living love of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We rise for the benediction. Now go forth into the world in the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go and may the living love of Jesus Christ be upon you and within you and work through you with one another and with the world God loves. Amen. Amen.